Hello, and welcome to Out of Many, a conversation series featuring national academicians participating in our digital annual exhibition, E Pluribus Out of Many, curated by Dr. Kelly Morgan. If you haven't yet explored the show, please do so when you're able. We're including the exhibition link in the chat. The exhibition contends with the challenge of creating a virtual exhibition, not just during a waning pandemic, not just amongst social upheaval and political turmoil, but also amongst a group of artists and architects who are as different as they are interesting. E Pluribus features over 100 academicians and asks the question, what new features can be what new futures can be created if Americans stop pursuing the ideal of national unity and accept our reality as an incongruent collective? Tonight, artist Don Procaro joined E Pluribus curator, Dr. Kelly Morgan in conversation. Please join us after the conversation for a live Q&A with Kelly and Don. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen to write your questions throughout the conversation. And we will make sure that Kelly and Don see them in the end. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kelly Morgan. Dr. Morgan is the newly appointed inaugural director of curatorial studies and professor of practice in history of art and architecture at Tufts University in Boston. She is a curator, educator, and social justice activist who specializes in American art and visual culture and her scholarly commitment to the investigation of anti-blackness within those fields has demonstrated how traditional art history and museum practice work specifically to uphold white supremacy. Dr. Morgan has held curatorial positions at the Indianapolis Museum of Art at Newfields, the Birmingham Museum of Art and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. She has held teaching positions at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University, Wayne State University, and the University of Michigan, where she merged the classroom and the museum gallery to create various anti-racist paradigms for how curators can actively address the complexities of traditional art history, community engagement, and scholarly innovation. In 2014, Morgan was awarded a dissertation fellowship from the Ford Foundation and earned her PhD in Afro-American Studies and Graduate Certificate in Public History Museum Studies from the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 2017. Thank you for joining us, Kelly. Oh, I need to unmute you. <laughs> there you go. Sorry. <laughs> Minor issue. Hopefully that's yeah. our only one. <laughs> I'm talking to you know, I typically never do that either. I always remember. <laughs> But I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, and so now, Kelly, you will introduce our artists of the evening. Yeah, it's, that is too a pleasure. Um, so um, Don and I and Leslie, too, I have known, uh, gosh, since the beginning of my career, you know, in terms of sometimes I'll say, you know, I get pulled into contemporary or kicking and screaming because I really like to stay in my historical eras. Um, but Don and Leslie have just been, you know, just wonderful friends um, and have just supported me for so long. So it is just such an honor to be here to talk to him tonight. And for those who don't know, I'll read a little bit of his bio. Don Bacaro is a New York based artist whose work explores the nature of human interactions with the physical world through archaeology and man made objects like tools, toys, and architecture. His work has been exhibited nationally and internationally. And he's been reviewed in the New York Times, Sculpture Magazine, Art in America, Art News, Bomb, and Newsday, among others. In 2007, he was the subject of a feature profile in Sculpture Magazine. Recent public art commissions include a 2017 work for the New Jersey Transit Light Rail Platform at Jersey Avenue in Jersey City, and a 2011 sculpture for the city of Puerto Slovenia, during his residency as the U.S. representative for the 50th Forma Viva International Sculpture Symposium. Bacarl was nominated for the International Sculpture Center's prestigious Educator of the Year Award and is the recipient of a 1991 Teaching Excellence Award from Parsons School of Design, where he taught since 1975 and is now Professor Emeritus of Fine Arts. Bacarl received his MFA in Sculpture from Columbia University and is a member of the American Abstract Artists. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Don Vaccaro. Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm great. And Good. you? Good. Like I, you know, I was, I was saying, I've been saying, this has been my response all the time. Like I'm tired. <laughs> But I'm, I'm upright, so that's good. 
That's all good. That's all, yeah, totally. So because we have like 45 minutes, I'm gonna just like, you know, totally jump right in because I think your sculpture, you know, is really like the epitome of the concept that I was thinking through, you know, for the show in and of itself. And just kind of, I think where we are as a, a country versus where we really want to be, right? Um, and you say this, you know, in your reflection, you know, where your work is kind of, um, you know, disjointed at the, at the base, right? And then it sort of conjoins as it moves, you know, upward in unity. So I wanted you to talk a little bit more about that design, because I know that's been kind of central, right, to how you use your work and its relationship, you know, to the show's theme and kind of where we are as a country. So um, just before the pandemic, I started a series called Everybody Knows. And it's a, a, a song by Leonard Cohen. And if you know the lyrics, it's uh, pretty telling about our time. And so I, um, I wanted to do pieces that had a sort of separateness that became one. And so this is, it fit right into your um, thematic of uh, the all um, becoming, parts becoming one. I work in layers, uh, geology, layers, uh, strata, um, and that's about time, but it's also about the multiple and how the multiple becomes a singular thing. Um, the image that I sent you had a split at the bottom, so two, we'll call them figures, back to back, and they grew into a singular um, object. Um, if I can reference Plato, Plato talked about finding a perfect match, but it, mm -hmm. it's become so powerful in that perfect match that he, the gods had to separate you. So I wanted to, I wanted to really um, talk a little about that in a time of confusion and, and I hate to even mention his name, Trumpism uh, and the separation of, uh, of how our country is being broken up. And I wanted to talk about that kind of a union of, um, of the parts um, to togetherness, not to separation. Right. And I think like that's a really, um, it segues like kind of perfectly into my next question because the, the work you mentioned in the layers, like we can see that right from the, the plates of marble, but it also has this really beautiful like human reference to it, you know, just not just the layers of society, you know, but like how layered we are in the, as individuals, you know, and I think the work stands, you know, I've said this to you before, like whenever I'm looking at your work and I'm face to face with it, I always, you know, it's like I'm waiting for it to speak to me, <laughs> you know, because it has that kind of playfulness and that human characteristic. So I want you to talk a little bit about that too, like how that plays into the overall design, but then also to like the overall um, tenor of the country. <clears throat> so the, um, these pieces evolved um, from archaeology and the ideas of the fragment telling a story of a whole culture. And, and as they grew from the tool, they became the toy, which is also telling to the figure, not, I don't do figures, but these have figuration in it. Um, and feet, body, head are all part of it. Um, feet have direction to it, have stability to it. Um, in uh, antiquities, you always see feet coming out of, mm -hmm. uh, of all types of sculpture, all types of reliefs. You always see the feet sort of peeking out, but it also tell, uh, tells us about that they are figurative and they are about placement and they are about movement. So if you look at an Egyptian uh, uh, petroglyph, you'll see it almost looks like it's moving, even though the feet mm -hmm. are moving. Um, so I, I want to uh, include that in, in the, uh, what I'm doing. Um, and I look at a lot of, of uh, archaeology. 
the layering um, uh, has always, I've always been interested in the layering. Ever, you know, every time I look at geology, I look at layering. I look at the fact that a certain layer becomes a, um, a you know, segment of a whole new time in, in my culture. Um, uh, and to, to talk a little about the collectiveness, um, maybe you can show that first slide. Could you show the first slide of the Visual Arts Center? Adrian? Adrian? No? No? Okay, anyway. Yeah. Oh, there it that is. That's in the show. Um, and here's the piece. And this collective of, of, of we'll, you can probably talk about them as being, uh, having a relationship to each other, but also, relationship to the community. And when they really, when people start moving through it, this was an installation at the Visual Arts Center out in Summit, New Jersey. And as people move through it, it activated them. They, um, uh, you know, moved and they became part of these pieces. So they became even more figurative by the people interacting with them. Um, and another, if you show the second slide, Okay, so here it is in um, uh, Bella Absinthe Park on 34th Street, two pieces. Um, and if you look behind those two people sitting at the fountain are all these little little sculptures that are embedded in the, in the um, sort of around the, the pool. Um, again, they become active when the surrounding, um, uh, when people interact with them. They become, and it was interesting. I would go down to this particular site maybe once a week to watch people how they interacted with these pieces because it's by, right by a subway stop and they would come out. Um, and it, it's, it's fascinating to see people caress a piece, um, to uh, not in any way try to harm it. They, you know, touched it, try to feel it feel the texture of the stone, um, try to be discreet about it. Um, and it's interesting to be in a public space like this and in the middle of New York City and not have um, any, I mean, any, it was all amazingly positive, the experience of watching people. And then the little pieces in the back, the very colorful pieces in the back were the, uh, um, sort of the toys of the little kids. They would just climb up and try to get to them but there's water in front of them. So they interacted with uh, these, uh, these small objects that were placed around the, the pool. Um, so it's interesting to watch um, the interaction of people understanding that these are in their space and they are part of it. And I think that that's a, a, a something I really enjoy a lot, that it becomes part of it. I, I usually do, don't do really work in monumental scale. I work in sort of more, we'll call it people scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've often, and I know we've talked about this many years ago, right? Like, I've, 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 like I've, I typically want to like hug. <laughs> you know, your sculptures are very calming, you know, for me. Um, and, you know, I don't know. And I don't know if that's like the material itself, you know, um, or I think I, I should say I get that kind of from the material itself, but then also um, from its like its actual presence, you know, so like Leslie Dill just said in the comments, like it's very warming, right? And then the small, the small pieces, you know, are very playful. So it like it taps into, you know, a part of oneself, you know, particularly like you were saying, like in this area, you know, this area, this park in this area of New York that we, I think we tuck away, you know, when we're moving around in the world, you know, in our sort of business mind, or even if we're in our like, you know, I need my first coffee for the day, <laughs> you know, mine. Um, and your work has a, has a really wonderful way, or does that in a really wonderful way now where it just kind of pulls you back to this other part of yourself um, that I don't think we rest with, you know, enough in our day to day, you know, so my, well, um, I'm, I'm, just let me add one no, uh, go ahead. Uh, installation. 
it was up during Comic Con, uh, what is it called? Comic Con, where they, they all dress up and everybody goes to Javits. And um, oh, uh, Comic Con, Comic Con, right? Yeah, Comic Con. Yeah. Um, and to see people dressed in every conceivable um, outfit walking through this space. Uh, and interacting with these pieces, which were odd for most people to look at, and them interacting with them was even um, a, just a wonderful experience. Uh, and it, it's not your person just coming from uh, the subway ready to go to work, but it was like this whole event that was going on in the park, in the Bella Absent Park. And it was really, really unusual and very special. Let's see that, that is cool. Yeah, that is super cool. I said the work, the work has a, it, it draws you in, you know, in that way, you know, and because uh, as a kid that was like, and to a certain degree, even as an adult, you know, that was alone most of the time, like so, like imaginary friends or that kind of thing, or like um, having, you know, to kind of sit my toys up in a way and have these conversations because <laughs> I didn't have siblings. You know, or like my friends in the neighborhood, like we weren't a huge church family. So my friends would, you know, particularly on Sundays, right? It was always, I was always home alone. Um, and your work just takes me back to like my five-year-old self, you know, <laughs> you know, doing that, you know, with my with my toys or, you know, or even just by myself in the backyard. It's like super, super cool in that way. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting, you know, I put in uh, all these, uh, the four images that I put in are all outdoor installations. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting to watch how people interact with them. Um, and if I can jump to the next image, if you can. Okay, so this was the um, installation at, uh, on the platform at Jersey, uh, Jersey Avenue Station. It was the commission in 2017, 2018. Um, and to watch people interact with this. Some people, you know, I, uh, when I got this commission, my proposal was if the hospital nearby, um, it, uh, I touched upon the DNA strand, uh, mm -hmm. the, the layering became stones from all over the world, which I use all the time, because I like that diversity in my work. Um, and we're talking about all over the world, we're talking about China, and India, um, mm -hmm. In Portugal, Zimbabwe, um, they come from all over, and I like that part of my um, the the, the, um, the layering that I that I do. That's my backstory. But it was interesting to watch people interact with this. Some people say, "Oh, it's so sexy." Okay, yeah, twisting leg. Oh, it's so sexy. And you come with the history. You come with your own personal history. And you talk about your childhood and you're, you know, you're playing with your, your dolls and your toys and how they were lined up. And you, that's your personal history that you're bringing to the work. Sure. And it was to, to listen to people talk about this particular piece and, uh, and interact with it. Um, and to have caressing and, and like, oh, it's so sexy. Oh, I look at it from a distance. Oh, it's like cross legs. Oh, I'm I'm on the sub. I'm on the train, and then look at this, and it's so it's an interesting um, uh, thing to put up a couple of pieces and to watch the interaction. It's not in the and uh, the white cube automatically sets the parameters uh, that a person is supposed to be looking at and not touch it and not be near it and not um, uh, you know it's like it's art. It's when you go public, it's a very different experience. Very, very different. So it's the gallery experience. How do, do people respond? What is that different response when they're in, when they're installed in galleries? Well, they're- Gallery very, show. They're very cautious. They'll move around a piece. In my studio, a person, I would have to say, you know, it's okay to touch something. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the, um, the last slide, uh, that uh, um, put up is the installation in the in triennial in um, Bauerdotz, uh, Switzerland. Um, and I, I should have added a couple of other images where people are actually caressing the pieces and, and mm -hmm. with them. Um, 
but if you if you have to give them permission to do that and in a gallery you would never give them permission to do that right uh, um, you know uh, all of a sudden it becomes a commodity and it changes the dynamics these were commodities too they were selling them but the but the interaction outside people sneaking up and touching it um, uh, the middle piece by the way is the piece that's in the um, the mm -hmm. online and, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it shows a little differently in the outdoor space uh, because you're looking at it down through the, um, the, you know, the three pieces. But it's interesting to watch uh, the interaction. We had a great time in Switzerland watching people uh, sort of work with the piece. And this is like more of a logistical question that like, maybe people in our audience don't like, this is not like a sexy question, right? <laughs> but as a curator, I'm like, how do you ship them, Don? Like, do you, cause I know how heavy the slabs are. So. Uh, uh, the, every, every single layer comes off. Comes off, okay. Um, and there are these um, uh, threaded stainless steel rods that run through it and they all get bolted together. Um, and the, the story about this is that uh, we weren't sure because it was in the, uh, during the pandemic whether we could go to install. Mm -hmm. And so these detailed uh, photographs of every joint and sent it. Um, uh, we're talking about 140 photographs of every single joint, how, how a nut would go on. And I even had to send them all the tools to do it because uh, metric versus inches. You know, yes. Blah, blah, blah. But um, everything comes apart. And they put, it, they put it together without me being there. And, uh, oh, that's it. amazing. Yeah. That's, that's like the nerdy, like, registrar in me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, how, like, how is that, how is that happening? <laughs> Just thinking about the like, just all of the moving pieces. Uh, you know, I, I, to bore everybody, it was twelve crates, a little over five thousand pounds shipped. Mm -hmm. uh, just to tell you that what these uh, uh, together or apart, they weigh a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like I'm always like, I think one pr primarily because I was trained by registrars. So I think a lot like that, you know, um, yeah. the two, cause I don't think, you know, people always see the finished product, you know, and I always like to give people a more like a, a ways in which I can, right. To kind of give people an inside look um, at like how, right. Not just artists are putting these, these works together, but then, you know, how galleries, how museums, you know, how like the other people behind the scenes that get us to, you know, the final project. You know that they're interact that they're interacting with, um, and I, I, they say a lot about that because this show is particularly you know online, right? So they may not be able to see the actual piece you know in that's in out of many, but they can go to Jersey, right, or they can catch a train and go see some of your other pieces, you know, and have those interactions. I think that's important. It's it, it's a uh, you know every even showing these in a photograph does not give you the same uh, experience. Now you had asked me when we were starting before we started this if I had a piece started, and I'm going to do something which um, I'm going to walk you into my workspace and show you one piece that started, so you can see. Okay. So here is a piece that's just ready to be. Yeah. And it's just starting. So you see all the, you can see all the components and the, and the, where they all get put together. So that's, what happens? <laughs> but you would ask, I usually don't do that, but you would ask, and I figured, okay, I'll show it to you. Uh, uh, oh, I've lost your sound. 
I'm sorry, I was I had muted myself. Um, I was like, I feel special. I super appreciate it. Uh, yeah, because I think people would look at your would look at your work and ask that question, like how like how are these put it together? You know, put together. Um, just the sure, just even just looking at the sheer amount of layers, you know, because you cut every slab, correct? Everything is cut. Here. Everything yeah. Gets and it depends on what it, um, uh, the piece uh, for New Jersey Transit it was five and a half months of work. Okay. With three assistants. Yeah, wow. But it gets finished, it gets polished all from here. On the it. And reassembled and assembled and reassembled. <laughs> That's what keeps me in shape. You know, just... Yeah, that's good. <laughs> So mission the mission in the assistant. I wanted your assistance. I wanted to ask you because I know you've been retired now for what five years, <clears throat> three years. You missed the classroom. Um, I miss the students. I do not miss the administration. As yes. you can now that you are a professor, you know very challenging. Yeah, students, it's like not stepped into it. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, I was chair for 10 years, so I was chair of the Fine Arts Club for 10 years. Okay. So it, uh, it was even more of a challenge because you're getting it from the dean, you're getting it from the students, you're getting it from faculty, so you're negotiating all of these things. Um, uh, and, it, you know, it's an interesting challenge. It's something that I, I um, hated and loved. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it was something that I could actually um, uh, change and move a program and be contemporary with the program and try to constantly have the program morph into something um, mm -hmm. uh, that becomes vital for today. Yeah. Um, and it's challenging because you're on it all the time. All the time. Mm -hmm. and again, just... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm saying, and then you're coming back to the studio and you're trying to work, and then you go back. So that was going to be my next question: Did the how did your how do you feel your students or or did they like really shape your work over the years? Like, did that change as you got as like student generations changed? Is that is that did I ask that correctly? Does that make sense? <laughs> um, certainly, they. Uh, uh, Students over the 40 years, 40 yes, plus years that I taught there have changed drastically and the program changed drastically. And mm -hmm. as we look at ideas versus um, um, uh, sort of technical uh, information uh, changes, um, culture changes, um, uh, you know, so many, uh, so many parts uh, have changed. Um, that's the fun part for me. I love mm -hmm. that part that I can, I can actually uh, grow with, with the students and what they're thinking and try to, try to see how I fit into um, their thinking and uh, whether I can approach them or not approach them, how, how that happens. Um, does my work, was my work um, influenced by the students? I, Probably, I don't know. We, we live in a sort of a world where things crash together all the time. So I don't know if I really, I don't think, I think it went the other way. But, um, but you know, I can't deny that when you know, you're around 25 students, right. 15 students in a class, 25 students are grad students, and they're having conversations about um, theory or about uh, process or about ideas or um, it certainly you may see things you may have a oh during the time when you're talking about to another student or to a student you may have an epiphany about your own work oh yeah I mean, that makes sense for me too so um, mm -hmm. and, um, I think it's about trying to be as open as you can um, for ideas and I think um, also to be as cur curious as you can. I don't think that um, curiosity should stop <laughs> ever, 
think we should all be curious for for as long as we can, you know, make work, look, yeah. look add and change and move. And I, I, you know, I look at my work in the studio now, and I look at the older work and the very colorful work, and I look at the the stone work now. I look at it. Um, it's changed a lot over the years. Um, I just installed or reinstalled a piece um, uh, from 1986 uh, up in Woodstock on last Monday, a week ago Monday. And it was interesting to try to remember how it was, it was, it was taken from one side of an outdoor piece, a very heavy outdoor piece, and, and it was taken and stored. And then two years, because of the pandemic, was moved to a new site. Uh -huh. and, and so, and I had to reinstall it. And it was um, an, a 1986 piece. It's like, wow, did I do work like this in 86? <laughs> and then you try to think about, well, what has stuff like that moved with me? Has it, yeah. has it changed, not changed? Am I thinking the same way? Or the, um, and it's and you know, my stacking stones the same way. <laughs> yeah. but, but it was, it's an interesting thing to see a piece that you know that's lived since 1986. Mm -hmm. You know, and then moves now to a new home. So. No, I think that's like so apt. Like I've been, I think the last year has been that for me too, in like my curatorial practice, like things that now makes sense to me <laughs> you know that my grandparents taught me or would say or things that I have done that I just kind of took for granted right where it was like oh that's just kind of an automatic thing that has now that I now understand is like has been completely foundational to how I've done the work the whole time you know but was like totally unaware <laughs> you know in the Indiana situation it just brought a lot of that to there for me you know where it was like oh now I can actually like formulate it in a way that I never even thought I was doing <laughs> you know so yeah I super get that yeah I think that's interesting because I think it does and I think you're right it's like we just kind of move through whatever our ideas are you know whatever's going on in life you know you get married you have kids you know you get a new job or whatever and you don't often think about you know the ways in which things stick with you you know, or take new shape, you know, as you grow. So um, when are we aware of, of the experience? I mean, are we at that moment aware of the experience or is it 10 years from now and go, oh, we didn't mm -hmm. Sometimes we're just not ready to accept it or to know it or to recognize it. And it takes a long time and, and maturity and, and to, to say, oh yeah, wait a minute, this is this is, this was important, um, you know, to and to revisit it and to and to think about how um, certain things uh, affected you years ago. So, uh, yeah, it's all very interesting. Very, uh, it is. It is. So, what's next? What are we pushing toward in the future or near future? Um, well, there's a, a number of things happening in Europe, and okay. um, I'm going to talk about Jameson. Uh, and, but uh, off of the triennial, there's a couple of things. Oh, good. Um, and what, what I'm working with right now, uh, I'm trying to um, put in small pieces what mm -hmm. I do. You know, so I have been so. Um, I'm, I'm. Oh, the guy who does those heavy outdoor pieces, and I'm trying to think about how I would put that same energy into a little tiny piece. Oh, and uh, I'm going to walk over here. I'm going to do what I was told not to do. So, okay. <laughs> let me see if we can see this. So. Oh, guys. So, um, by the way, these are some drawings of mine as well. Um, works on paper. So, you know, try to put that energy that a big piece, uh, that a big piece has, 
And how do you do it in a small, in a, in a small piece? I'm sorry, I'm just jumping here. Um, how do you do it in a small piece and keep the energy and not just make it look like a model? And I'm not right. interested in doing models of any of my work. It's just not okay. what I uh, How to do it for the commission. Uh, and often you have to do it if you're commissioning you're putting in proposals. It's not the way I think, it's not the way I work. Um, and I do a lot of prep drawings and a lot of prep thinking about how to, how to do stuff. And I prep uh, a lot of, I buy a lot of stones so I can choose what to use and mm -hmm. what to use. And again, I'm very much aware of where the stone comes from. Uh, because I, I do not want to be just, oh, yes, he, know, he's, he just works in Italian normal. That doesn't interest me. Uh, and uh, so I'm very aware um, when, I, when I buy the stone that it is you know, stone from all over the world. And, mm -hmm. and try to, and these are backstories. It's sort of my, you know, the way I think, but not necessarily that people would know that, oh, that. Is that stone is from Portugal? Oh, that's from Zimbabwe. Oh, but it looks like Belgium. No, but it's it's not. Mm -hmm. So it gets diversity in the pieces without being obvious. Yeah, I like so, that. Small pieces are, are I like them. Down. They're great. So, so um, we have more questions. We have more things. Yeah, we are at, we're like right at 740. So I think Adrian is fine. I think we can open it up to the to the audience now because that gives heard, us about 20. I heard my cue. <laughs> Ready for yes. some Q&A. <laughs> um, so it looks like we've gotten some questions in the chat. I just want to remind everybody in the audience, if you have a question uh, for either Kelly or for Don, please drop that in the chat. That's how we'll be able, not in the chat, sorry, in the Q&A function. Um, that's how we'll be able to see it. So we're not, if you're, if you, anybody has tried to do the raising hand function, we actually aren't using that just as a reminder. Um, so there's a couple questions. Also, there's some comments. So I don't know if you've been seeing them pop up, but I just thought it would be nice to uh, read out that some people are saying they're enchanting and people love the small, uh, the small pieces. Um, so here is a question from Medri McPhee. Marble being the unwieldy material that it is, I'm curious about how you proceed to find the form and the particular color and dimension of the layers in each piece. Is that for Kelly or for me? <laughs> no. Uh, uh, the forms are, I hate to, uh, to say, sometimes I lay on the floor and draw myself and they become uh, part of the, outline of a figure um, uh, and so that becomes part of it um, sometimes they become much more um, totem like where they, they um, sort of emerge and, and reach up to um, um, you know uh, that are more columns or totems um, there is a figurative gesture in almost everything um, and um, how I pick the, the, the color of the stone, I look at um, every single one of these pieces has some reference to geology. Um, the little black lines in pieces or the discoloration in a piece um, references uh, certain layers in, in this. These are my backstories. These are what I, um, how I, think about them. Um, reference the turn of a, a whole time frame you know, geologically. So a little black line could be a, if you look at cliffs and you see little black um, soot lines, it means that at a certain point there was a volcanic uh, eruption causing you know, extinction and then another a whole nother a generation of, of um, animals and mammals and, you know, changed. And so um, I try to be aware, very aware of those. And that's my backstory. That's not what people would be looking at necessarily, but it's what I think about. Um, the, uh, the, 
the spiral in the pieces, there's a lot of, of, of rotation in the pieces, and they came from that, uh, that DNA, quote unquote, DNA strand um, that I was, had been looking at a lot. And so the spiral um, uh, was a, a DNA strand, and then even as people started approaching it and saying, oh yeah, it looks like cross legs, I started looking at my own body and saying, oh yeah, I cross my legs like that too. So I, I'm, I'm trying to be aware of my surroundings when I um, put these pieces together. I hope that answers Mitch's question. I think so. Well, we'll wait to hear from the, the chat to see if there's additional follow-ups. Um, this is a question from Babs Rheingold. Hi, Don. As you know, we own and love some of your cast cement work. And I was wondering if you can talk a little about the cast cement work versus the stone and the transition to the current stonework. I know you've worked in stone for years, too. I was wondering if you think there's a specific relationship between the two. Um, I think that uh, a lot of the earlier cast pieces, I did a, a number of cast pieces, uh, really helped me understand these larger uh, shape pieces, they became, uh, the cast pieces became almost, uh, we'll, we'll call it the ideas for these other, these newer pieces. So yes, there is a, um, a, a, a continuity of it. Prior to the cast pieces, I was doing stone pieces, and I was talking about it earlier, the 86, big 86 stone sculpture. Uh, that grew into the cast pieces, that the cast pieces grew into these pieces. <clears throat> so yes, um, the cast, excuse me, <clears throat> the cast pieces do um, uh, help me under, helped me understand these, these newer pieces. And I'm still interested in doing, doing them. I haven't done them in a while, but they're, they're a pretty interesting way of, of uh, realizing a, so this maybe ties in because we just talked about two different materials or ways of working. So there's a question about how you began to make work with, it says this mythic material, but I'm assuming we're talking about marble and stone in that question. Um, I experimented with a lot of, in grad school, I uh, did a lot of welding. I taught welding for 40 years. Uh, my father was a welder, so I understood metal. And I, it was always a problem with, with uh, forming uh, the metal. And, and um, I always found I was fabricating a shape rather than um, finding a shape. Um, and I did some wood pieces and I just was never, just not satisfied with them. And then I discovered I worked with a sculptor who was um, um, a person who was a, really a carver, not, not what I do. I, I use stone, but I, I don't think of myself as a carver. I'm not, you know, uh, staring with a hammer and chisel. I have it very rarely with a hammer and chisel. Um, so I think of myself as a fabricator, but not as fabricating uh, individual shapes, but rather forming uh, an overall shape of the stone. How did I get there? Um, I guess I got turned on by, you know, uh, working. I when, One of the jobs I had, I was assistant to a, a sculptor, um, and we spent two summers in Nebraska building this monster, monster, monster piece in stone and in the underlying stone. And so maybe that was sort of the turning point for me um, to start working on stone. So I think that that's probably it, and uh, you know, I, I, and the and the um, the layering of the stones. I did this monster piece in Slovenia, um, and I could never do it here in New York. You know, three and a half meters high. It was that about twelve feet high. Um, it, it weighed five tons. It's gigantic thing. You can't do something like that in New York, um, and. It's how you have to say, okay, I have a studio practice in New York. And how can I deal with this idea of, of assembly 
um, in a little different way. So there's always challenges you never learn all the time. I think you always have to learn. So um, back to this idea of stone uh, that you mentioned, you have stone from all over. Thomas Moore, uh, one of our uh, staff members here asked, uh, Don, is the nature of your practice to incorporate stone from all over the globe intentional? What conversation around diversity might you hope your work evokes? Um, I have always liked um, that. I, again, too often we, um, I, as a stone, as a person who works in this material, too often it's like, oh, I work in Kuala, I work in Italy, or I work in Kerala, and so therefore you only work in. And I, I um, kind of reject that idea. And um, I um, like the idea of pulling from all parts of the world. And I'm um, looking at a piece that has limestone from, from Israel um, and marble from Italy. Uh, uh, that's uh, I'm looking at it, it's, uh, I'm trying to figure out limestone from uh, Indiana, Italian marble. Um, I, I just find it um, it's the subtle diversity um, that I like. Um, that I, I I I think all art is political, but it, but it depends on how that narrative moves, but how far it moves in one direction or another. I'd like to be very subtle about it. Okay. Well, I was gonna hold off on this, but I just was <laughs> gonna hold off this question, but now I think you gave me a, a connecting point to, uh, I'm just gonna do a shout out to an interview that Kelly and I did about the show that is on our website. So again, if you have not had a chance to check out the show, please do so. We will redrop the link in the chat. Um, but you had you made this statement about all work is political, just kind of depends on how you're looking at it. And that kind of taps into parts of what we were talking about um, about the show. So Kelly, I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit to one, how you see Don's work directly connecting to the theme of the show and this idea of work being political or not, or the ways you were, as you mentioned in the interview, kind of surprised by how people approached the prompts, which was the theme of the show. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> when, I, when I first thought of like what I wanted, you know, playing with E Pluribus Unum, right? And like, you know, that I thought of Don's work immediately, right? Because <laughs> I know how, you know, how he puts it together. And I know, you know, just knowing him personally, and I know about, you know, the stones um, from around the world. And I was like, Don's work is perfect. So tech, so then I was like, okay, like his work was kind of, after I got the submissions, it was like his work was central, Liz's work was central, Carrie's work was central. Um, and my thinking about it, because it was so apt, you know, and I was like, how do I talk about, basically, like, if I could turn one of Don's sculptures inside out, you know, it was like, how would I do that? And then I kind of left that because I didn't want to, like, overinterpret, you know, and so I kind of moved on. But it was really um, fascinating. It's like from the layering itself, you know, to the, like I said, being disjointed at the bottom, right, and, like, coming up into unity. And I think that's what we've always strived for you know, as a country, or maybe, you know, mythologized ourselves as doing, you know, over the, what, 350 years, you know, this country has been a country um, that we've never really realized, you know, and I think Don's work sort of exists as a representation, you know, of how it can happen, you know, if you're deliberate about it, right, so that he's very deliberate about, you know, buying, you know, putting that diversity there by buying stone from different places, you know, very deliberate about working through design, you know, to make it work, you know, and so I think it challenges us in that way, you know, to say, what are we deliberate about doing, you know, are we going to do the work, you know, versus are we just going to kind of tout the narrative, and I think where we kind of landed, I think, well, I should say COVID, you know, kind of landed us in a at a point as a country, um, that really delineated, you know, how much we are willing to talk about it, you know, but not necessarily willing, you know, to do the work. And I wanted to ask, you know, the academicians to kind of grapple with that, you know, um, 
not so much to like literally answer it, you know? So some work, you know, some submissions were like, you know, overtly political, totally to the point, I think it's something like, you know, Suko's submission for instance about Katrina and what was actually happening to people in the Superdome, you know, post the storm itself. Um, and then work like Eric um, Aho's, you know, and like a lot of the, the landscape work, you know, that, that got us to kind of come back to the idea of like natural beauty, but also through this lens of like, this is of climate change, you know, and this is what we're losing, you know, if we don't really, you know, become honest with ourselves, you know, about what we're doing as people. You know, so, and, and that makes me think of um, Squeak's work too, you know, like in the, the, in terms of the, like the impressions that, that we've made, you know, over the centuries. Um, and so it was really awesome, you know, to get, to get the, to get all of these different submissions, like the political work, which I, which I was kind of like, okay, cool. Yeah, I got this, but like, <laughs> you know, I know what to do with this. Uh, but some of the other, like I said, you know, kind of landscape work and the abstract work that even challenged my assumptions you know, even sort of forced me, you know, to think about things differently, um, you know, to think about the theme, you know, differently. And I just, I appreciated that, you know, and I think it's really great because you hardly ever see, you know, unless it's like a biennial, right? It's like, you hardly ever see like this many different types of work in one place, you know, all addressing the same thing. Yeah, and I want to actually, oh, it sounds like you're commenting, Doug. So I was going to say, I want to hear your take on your work included in this group of peers, the National Academicians, and the theme of the show. What were your thoughts? Um, I, I really found the, the, uh, the span of, of the type of work in this that touched on these subjects, some subtly, some more obvious, the narrative swinging both ways, um, uh, are, uh, was pretty exciting to see it. And it wasn't so funnel vision that uh, we only can look at work in a very particular way. Um, I do work that's, we'll say, relatively subtle. Um, and if you even, if you don't know the reference, if everybody knows uh, the uh, Leonard Cohen song, you wouldn't know what he's saying about the pandemic. He, you know, I got a copy of it from here. He says in, in the song, uh, I love, where can I find it? Uh, everybody knows that the, uh, the uh, plague is coming. Everybody knows, and it's coming on fast. And this is just as when it, this song is back, what is it, 2000 or so? Uh, and, um, but I work in a very particular way. I, work very, my, I like being subtle about things, it's not um, uh, so obvious. But it's nice to see the, the, the span of work that's, that's in the show. Um, and it's not just one thing. And I, I like the idea of it being thought of as a, a biennial uh, because that can be picked, you can pick and choose by the quality of the work and um, uh, the overall thematic of the work. So I'm gonna shift lanes because there's a couple of questions about like the logistics of how you make these, how, how you do uh, it, uh, which is a fair question, especially as we were talking. Like I'm really, I know, I know that I said like maybe the shaky camera work, but actually I think it was very enlightening to see the, the space. So thank you for that, Don. Um, but there's a question about just literally how you continue to work with these materials. This is from uh, Vincent Gargiulo, um, Don, I have been around you and your work for around 40 years through the limestone pieces, uh, many concrete pieces, especially the playful, color, playful, colorful concrete work, and back to the latest, more neutral, serious marble work. I understand that you enjoy the materials, but does your body ever tell you that the materials are just too damn heavy and you need to give it a break? I personally move from metal to paper as I've gotten older. How do you do it? <laughs> Yeah, Vince knows that. Um, um, you know, I do it because I love doing it. And, uh, you know, um, yeah, uh, I go home, I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, uh, what can, what can, uh, um, it's okay. You know, I'll, I'll, I will probably do it as long as I can do it. And I, I don't have any desire to, you know, 
um, to start doing pieces in in styrofoam. I don't, I doesn't doesn't interest me. Um, and uh, you know, my knees go, yeah, all right. <laughs> so, yeah. so another question. This is about process from the beginning, and I know you sh you said when you show the small works that those aren't uh, maquettes, those aren't studies. But the question is, how do you proceed? Do you draw preliminary sketches? Um, I'm always, you know, making notations. I don't try. I try not to. Um, I I find when I have to, I have to. When you know, for, for a commission piece, you have to do drawings. You have to do these things. Um, uh, I would prefer not doing a drawing. It's it's for me. Uh, what happens with a, a, with a, uh, a drawing of a piece, you find yourself being trapped in, oh, I have to do it exactly like the drawing. So uh, a notation um, about, um, you know, a certain uh, form that I'm interested in or a notation or a photo. Um, I have photos on my wall here of my Picasso stove, which is stacked stack or, um, up a um, little sketch. You said not to do this. Do it. I'll, I'll see if I can. So here is some prep drawings. Uh, and so it's a it's not as um, they're not drawn pieces, but they're of ideas of just mm -hmm. sort of, uh, oh, I just need to figure out this form and so I'll, I'll do a little drawing or something. I'll look at a, a, you know, some weird shoe that I saw and I'll do a little sketch of that shoe. And some, at some point it may become part of a piece and not always part of a piece, but it, it's just my prep drawings. And sometimes they're just drawings on my work table to just to work out a, a particular shape or a template that I cut out to work out a, a shape. But I, I don't like doing the drawing of a piece. It just, even my, my uh, uh, drawings earlier, I showed a few drawings on, uh, are, are of ideas, not of pieces. Mm. Um. I think this is an interesting question about, um, this is from Andrew Ginzel. How do you consider and relate to the inherent humor that appears present in your work? I, 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 I love whimsy. I, I think it, uh, um, the, I like the absurdity of some of these things, like you know, you know, these big clumsy feet or uh, this wild head. Or, um, I, I like that, and some of the pieces become even more whimsical than others. But um, uh, no, I, I think there is there is it, it that also helps um, the interaction with people. I think that when people feel like oh, there's something lighthearted about it, it's not so serious, it's not so deep into art theory, but rather there's something personal about it, or something that's that's fun about it, that they can approach a piece in a, in a very different way than, and then uh, being totally serious. The pieces are serious, but there is a little bit of whimsy in some of them. And then, uh, there's, I'm looking across my studio to some of these pieces, which are pretty kind of wacky, uh, whimsical uh, pieces. But um, I, yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, I have one last, well, I have a last question here from the audience, um, but then I also want to give Kelly a moment to think if there's any last questions you have. So we'll throw it to you after I ask this one question from the audience. Um, that geological, this is from uh, Medri McPhee, that geological aspect of your work is really interesting. To that end, what makes you decide whether or not to add a kind of head versus just ending the piece with a bodily kind of gesture and a flat ring on top? Um. You know, I, I, you know, I don't. If we if we talk about a, let's talk about a column. Column is referenced the same way as a figure is referenced: feet, body, head. And 
I don't know if I think of them as head heads, but I think of them as referential. So I think of uh, the body of, of a piece as I would think of the body of a column, um, the feet of a column, uh, the um, you know uh, uh, head is is a you know loose reference because there are certain pieces here that don't have hopefully again close head to it, but it has a top, and uh, I like referencing the body in, in pieces, but it, it may, a lot of them don't have head, and particularly the 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 big installation that has a top on it, it spins and it stops at the top. And if I'm looking at a, a column piece in my studio now that goes up eight feet, but it doesn't have a head to it, it just sort of rises up to, to the top. So um, I um, so some pieces don't don't have a top that looks head down. How is that? Kelly, so, any last questions? So my, the thing that I've been thinking about listening to you tonight, Don, is like, there's a lot of balance, <clears throat> whether it's, you know, theme, design, color, right, diversity. Have you ever thought about like pushing the balance at all? You know, so maybe doing one in like all the same stone and all the same color, right? Or um, what's another like way to like kind of play, you know, on that. Um, that's the only thing that's coming to my mind right now. But like, have you ever thought about actually like, like maybe twisting that balance a little bit or like, you know? You know, I, I um, uh, we talked about that piece that I installed uh, uh, from 86 was all in limestone. It was mm. one um, tone. Uh, had a lot of elements. It was balanced very differently. It didn't have a center of gravity to it, like all of these pieces have a sort mm -hmm. of central, you know, body central um, uh, location. It's balanced by the feet. It didn't have any of those things. Uh -huh. um, these also early on, these big slab pieces that just floated on the floor. Um, uh, of singular singular stones that were much more architectural. Uh, mm -hmm. I've also done uh, some, uh, actually, a lot of wall hanging uh, pieces, which um, you know, sort mm -hmm. of make note. Uh, you know, having the stone that's sort of draped on the wall is sort of like uh, in this is this of what you expect a stone to do, right? Uh, so um, yeah, I played around with those ideas. Uh, this body of work um, you know, is, I think, this body of work. And yeah. I, uh, um, I don't say that tomorrow will be the there's a move, and I hope it moves, and uh, you know, it may it may go into that direction. It may not. Um, right now, you know, I'm interested in. In doing this, and right now again, I'm interested in doing this. How do you sort of build the energy in these small pieces? How do you infuse the energy, which is in a big piece, or the the sense of touch in these small pieces that, that are in there? So that's what I'm playing with right now. Um, it doesn't doesn't mean that I'm I'm, I'm going to stay there for the rest of my life. Um, you know, there's a very good chance that I not <laughs> so good well, thank you so much this was so wonderful thank you adrian thank Appreciate you both it. for joining thank you kelly for curating the show and don for participating um we've just dropped the link in the chat for next week's talk which will be fred tomaselli speaking with our uh, chief curator at the national academy sarah reisman um if you would like to support us, visit our website. Uh, there's a support us tab and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. The whole uh, calendar is also on the website so you can see an RSVP for all of the future talks. Great. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Bye.